subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello and welcome to rao zaiyer's gns session we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 7th march 2022 we shall take up articles pertinent for civil service exam and discuss them as per the demand of the exam there is an article on page number 1 ajit pawar takes a dig at the governor of maharashtra although this is a political news which is of new use for us but this news is in the context of shivaji also in the context of savitri bhai and jyoti rao phule people of maharashtra have taken exception to something that the governor of maharashtra has said regarding shivaji he has said that the poet saint samarth ramdas he was guru of chhatrapati shivaji samarth ramdas he was brahmin and the interpolation that people have done to say that the brahmin was guru of chhatrapati shivaji is to impose brahminism whatever it is we are not going to get into it it is not worthy to get into but we'll talk about from the perspective of civil service examination the contribution of shivaji you see marathas they were marathi speaking warrior group from the western deccan plateau and because of the prevailing political condition of that time they had to rise to power and they rose to prominence by establishing a hindavi swarajya meaning the self rule of hindus marathas became very prominent in the 17th century under the leadership of shivaji maharaj shivaji revolted against adil shah dynasty and also against the mughals and he carved out a kingdom out of the regions of influence of these two dynasties with his capital at raigad shivaji finally declared himself as an independent ruler in 1674 and he took the title of chhatrapati meaning the sovereign authority and with this the maratha empire came into existence the maratha empire under shivaji extended to maharashtra karnataka and till tamil nadu at its peak the maratha empire entered into afghanistan as well chhatrapati shivaji laid a strong foundation of very sound administration and the administrative setup of shivaji was to a certain extent inspired from the deccan style of administration Here the king was the pivot of government, and he was assisted by a council of ministers called as Ashtar Pradhan. There were eight prominent position in his council. There were Peshwa. Peshwa was the most important. He looked after the finance and the general administration, and later Peshwas were given the position of prime minister. Sari Nawabat or Senapati, he was the military commander. Amatya were used to be accountant general. Vakinavis were the intelligent officers. They also looked after the posts and the household affairs. Sachiv were the correspondents. Sumantha were the master of ceremonies. Nyadhish the justice, and Pandita Rao looking after charities and religious administration. The administration of any government has to have a very strong revenue foundation as well. Shivaji did a great work in the revenue reform. The revenue system was patterned on the Kathi system of Malik Ambar. Malik Ambar was the ruler of Ahmednagar of the Deccan. In Kathi system every piece of land is measured by a rod also called as kathi measurement of land is the first step in revenue reform the lands were also classified into various categories like paddy fields the garden lands the hill tracts so that the revenue assessment can be done properly for every piece of land and based upon these classification and general assessment the produce was roughly assessed and on the basis of assessment the cultivators were asked to pay 40% of their produce as land revenue shivaji did away with jagirdari system wherever it was possible and he largely introduced rayatwari system in rayatwari system the revenue is directly collected from the farmers this is more efficient system of governance between the governed and the sovereign authority the revenue system of shivaji was also lenient towards the farmers they had the option to pay either in cash or kind the peasants could also pay the revenue in installments and during the time of famine or any other national calamity the state also offered loans to the peasants for rayatwari system to be effective there has to be in place audit mechanism of revenue officers and the accounts of revenue officers were thoroughly checked shivaji was a ruler who was very observant and he did not lose the common touch he was continuously in touch with the happenings on the ground Shivaji largely removed the hereditary positions from his kingdom. He brought meritocracy, but there were few officials called as mirazdars. They had the hereditary rights of land, but Shivaji very strictly supervised the hereditary rights. Shivaji did his best to bring a rule-based order in his kingdom. 
there are two very important taxes in the kingdom of Shivanji. One is called as Chaut and the other is Sardeshmukhi. These taxes were not collected from the Maratha kingdom itself, but they were collected from neighboring territories. Chaut was one fourth of the land revenue of the concerned neighboring territory. Now, there are various accounts of various historians differing in their opinion. There are some historians who suggest that this was a kind of revenue system in line with Wellesley's subsidiary alliance. This one fourth of land revenue that Marathas under Shivaji collected, this was in lieu of protection given to that neighboring territory for any third party attack. But there are some historians who suggest that this was revenue collected in lieu of non-aggression from Maratha themselves. They were collecting the one fourth of land revenue just not to attack them. Whatever the exact purpose of Chauth may be, for the purpose of prelims examination, you know what the nature of Chauth was. It was a taxation not from the Maratha kingdom, but from the neighboring territories. And it was one fourth of the land revenue of that territory. This much would suffice. And Sardesh Mukhi was kind of cess on these taxes. It was an additional levy of 10%. And Marathas claimed this to be hereditary rights of theirs. Shivanji was responsible for bringing modern administration into the army. First of all, he regularized the army. Previously, the feudal lords, the subordinate generals, they didn't use to maintain a regular army. Traditionally, the soldiers used to work for a few months, maybe six or eight months, and they used to go back to work in fields. But Shivaji, before he became Chhatrapati Shivaji, an independent ruler and formed the Maratha dynasty, he started this practice of having soldiers to serve year-round. To make administration in the army fluid and smooth and clean, he started cash payment for the soldiers. Bhakti movement in the Maratha land already laid the foundation for patriotism. And Shivaji used patriotism to inspire soldiers. And this is still done in the modern states. Shivaji started branding of horses. He used to keep records of everything concerning army. He was very diligent in maintaining the administration of forts. He was not an arm distance ruler. He used to keep a close eye on everything. The topography of the region of Raigad and other parts of the initial area of Maratha kingdom, they had mountainous terrain. And this helped the soldiers of Shivanji and Maratha kingdom to excel in guerrilla warfare. This training of the Marathan army in guerrilla warfare helped them to subdue their enemies and attack and also to defend. Shivanji had liberal religious policy. This also contributed in the latter secular nature of Indian state. Although Shivaji was a cultured Hindu, but he was a tolerant Hindu ruler. He showed respect to the religious texts of all religions and he did not destroy the religious monuments or the religious place of worship of other religion. He protected Muslim ladies and children during the course of war. He also gave financial help to Muslim scholars and saints. He employed Muslims in the civil and military departments. There are accounts of some historians that there were 700 Muslim soldiers in the Marathan army. After Aurangzeb imposed jizya, Shivanji wrote a letter to Aurangzeb. In that letter, he wrote that God is the Lord of all men and not just of Muhammadans. Islam and Hinduism are only different pigments used by the divine painter to picture the human species. So Shivanji was not just a great and valiant soldier. He was a great ruler, efficient administrator, diligent legislator, and also a benevolent human being. There's a news article on the text and the context section of today's newspaper, the effect of Russia-Ukraine conflict on maritime trade. This article is based on the Turkey's decision to abide by the Montreux Convention, following which Turkey has banned Russian naval ships from passing through the Bosporus Strait. Via Montreux Convention, Turkey has control over the Bosporus Strait, which means it can essentially control the vessels, both military and civilian, in and out of Black Sea. It has been agreed upon that situation in Ukraine is a war. It is not special military operation. And declaration of situation in Ukraine as war has authorized Turkey to activate the Montreux Convention and ban Russian war vessels from entering the Black Sea through the Bosporus or the Dardanelles Strait. Here is the Bosporus Strait. This is said to be the border between Asia and Europe. And this is the Strait of Dardanelles. These two straits connect the Black Sea with the Aegean Sea through the Sea of Marmara. It is the only passage through which the Black Sea ports can access the Mediterranean and beyond. And over 3 million barrels of oil, which roughly amounts to 3% of daily global supply, which is produced mostly in Russia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, 
they pass through this waterway every day. And the route also ships large amount of iron, steel and agriculture products from Black Sea coast to Europe and the rest of the world. See, the Montrex Convention, it was signed among Australia, Bulgaria, France, Greece, Japan, Romania, Yugoslavia, UK, Soviet Union and Turkey. And it has been in effect since 1936. The essence of Montrex Convention is this. It gives control to Turkey over the water route between the Black Sea and the Asian Sea and by extension to its Mediterranean Sea. You know, Russia has a very important naval base at Sevastopol in Crimea. There is complete Russian control over Crimea, as you would know. However, for ships to move to and fro from Mediterranean and beyond, they have to pass through these two straits controlled by Turkey. The Montreux Convention sets limits on the passage of civilian vessels and military warships through the Dardanelles and Bosphorus Straits. According to the convention, in the event of a war, Turkey has the right to regulate the transit of naval warships and it has the right to block the strait to these warships belonging to countries involved in the conflict. The convention also says that any country having coastline on the Black Sea, like Romania, Bulgaria, Georgia, Russia or Ukraine, they must notify Turkey eight days in advance of their intention to send vessels of war through this strait. And the other countries not having border with Black Sea, they must give Turkey a 15 days advance notice. And the Turkey has the right to regulate. It is up to Turkey whether to stop or to allow. And Turkey has used this power bestowed on it by Montrix Convention before. During World War II, Turkey prevented the Axis power from sending their warship to attack Soviet Union. And it also blocked the Soviet army from participating in the combat operation in the Mediterranean Sea. But today, Turkey is in a tight fix. Turkey has good relations both with Ukraine and Russia. And both are important partners for critical energy supply and also for military trade. So there is this dilemma Turkey is having at one level, how to balance its relation between Russia and Turkey. And then there is dilemma at another level. Turkey is a member of NATO since 1952 and it wants to strengthen its relation with the West. It wanted to be a member of EU, but it does not want to upset Russia either. And the control of Turkey over Bosphorus Strait and Strait of Dardanelles is the key testing moment of its ability to balance its geostrategic relations. And it is in this context that Turkey has held that it cannot block all Russian warships accessing the Black Sea due to a clause in the Montreux Convention itself exempting those vessels returning to their registered base. And this exception provides Russia with an alternate way to exploit the Montreux Convention which could be used to reassign some of its vessels to the Black Sea. This is the lead article from today's newspaper. This article highlights that the high energy demand of European nations and their dependence on the gas supply from Russia is one of the main reasons behind Russia-Ukraine war. This is the lead article in today's newspaper. This article, Europe in fact, is the second largest market of energy in the world. And transition to green economy in European nation is not going to happen before at least two decades. Historically, Western capitalists were dominating the energy market in the West Asian country. But from 1960s, the Soviet Union started supplying cheaper oil, not only to East Europe, but also to West Europe. And this was not supposedly acceptable to the Western powers, US and UK. So after disintegration of USSR and the end of the Cold War, USA used expansion of NATO as a tool to stop the pipeline supply of energy by Russia via Eastern Europe. But Germany was in need of energy and it was keen of supply of fossil fuel from Russia. The supply channel through Ukraine came in trouble when protests broke out in Ukraine after the 2004 general election. And that's how the concept of Nord Stream came into existence. Nord Stream is this gas supply line from the western coast of Russia to the eastern coast of Germany. However, to counter the supply of gas, USA came up with higher supply of LNG in European nations. And US tried its best in not allowing Russia and Germany to expand the capacity of Nord Stream 1 via another pipeline, Nord Stream 2. During the Trump administration, the US ambassador to Germany wrote letters to the companies involved in building the terminal of Nord Stream 1. 
Nord Stream 1 was jointly owned by Russia and Germany. The majority stakeholder was Russia, but Germany also had stake in the project. Nord Stream 2 is wholly owned by Russia. But the Western nations and also some nation in Europe, they were extremely uncomfortable with this idea of Russia having multiple pipelines. United States, some European nations and also Ukraine, they considered it as a rise of Russian influence over Europe and this Russia will use as a geopolitical strategical tool to exert pressure and its hegemony on the European nations. The pipeline that used to pass through Ukraine, U Ukraine started to ask for a hefty amount of money to allow the pipeline to pass through it. So Russia had to pay $33 billion annually to Ukraine. Nord Stream 1 passes through the Baltic Sea. It goes coast to coast from Russia to Germany. In this map, you can see there are multiple gas pipelines beginning from Russia and running through entire Europe. There are gas pipelines through Ukraine as well, and Ukraine charge heavy amount to Russia for this. This increasingly high dependence of Europe on the gas supply of Russia is considered as one of the prime reasons for the war between Russia and Ukraine. US wanted Ukraine to become member of NATO. And in the past, US has used this strategy to roadblock the supply of gas through the pipelines or to stop the project entirely. There is a news article on page number 6. Water awards are a done deal. Kaveri Water Award given previously is a done deal. That is a stand of Karnataka. The Water Resource Minister of Karnataka has met the Union Jal Shakti Minister with an opinion that negotiable settlement is not advisable after the tribunal awards. Let us take this opportunity to quickly revise Kaveri Water Dispute. First of all, it is a dispute of Kaveri River among four states and UTs, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Kerala and Puducherry. The dispute is pretty old and in 1990 to resolve the dispute, Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal was set by Government of India. This body was formed under the provision of Interstate River Water Dispute Act 1956 and Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal gave the final verdict in 2007. At this point, it's important for me to bring your attention to Article 262. Article 262 says that Parliament may by law provide for the adjugation of any dispute or complaint with respect to the use, distribution or control of the waters of or in any interstate river or river valley. Now, since that body has to be formed as the provision of a law, so the law in this case is Interstate River Water Dispute Act 1956. So under the provision of Article 262 and this law, this body was constituted, Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal. It gave the verdict in 2007, but the parties were not happy and it went to the Supreme Court. However, it is also important for you to note that Article 262 also says that Parliament may, by law, provide that neither the Supreme Court or any other court shall exercise jurisdiction in respect to any dispute or complaint as mentioned above, meaning the courts will not have jurisdiction in interstate river water dispute, if Parliament by law provides so. But however, by now during your course of preparation, you must have been aware that judiciary in India is very, very innovative. And by the virtue of your preparation, you would be aware by now that a citizen or any aggrieved party can approach High Court or Supreme Court directly if there is violation of fundamental right under the provision of Article 32. And Supreme Court linked the issue with one of the fundamental right as mentioned in Article 21, right to life. So now the issue can come to Supreme Court and it cannot be stopped by any law. So Supreme Court allowed the case to come to it through special leave petition mentioned in Article 136 and the case went to Supreme Court. Supreme Court gave its final verdict in February 2018. It modified the judgment given by Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal and directed the central government to draft a scheme under Section 6A of Interstate Water Dispute Act. Section 6A of the Act basically authorizes the central government to make a scheme to implement the decision of the tribunal. So following the direction of the Honorable Supreme Court, central government submitted a draft Kaveri Water Management Scheme under which two bodies were formulated, Kaveri Water Management Authority and Kaveri Water Regulation Committee. Kaveri Water Regulation Committee basically is the executive arm of Kaveri Water Management Authority. It is a body that works on ground. It is a body that will take 
day-to-day -day data on water levels and the storage and the usage and the release and so on. And using that data, Central Water Management Authority will ensure that the judgment of the tribunal as modified by the Supreme Court is being implemented. So now let's talk about this very important body, Kaveri Water Management Authority, because this is very, very important for the prelims examination. Kaveri Water Management Authority is going to be the sole body to implement Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal Award as modified by the Supreme Court. The central government will have no say in implementing the scheme except for issuing administrative advisories. Kaveri Water Management Authority will comprise a chairman, a secretary and eight members. Two members will be permanent, two members will be part-time by the central government and four members will be representative of the four states and union territories party to this dispute. There is no full-time chairman appointed yet and the chairman of the Central Water Commission is the acting chairman of Kaveri Water Management Authority. And the main mandate of Kaveri Water Management Authority, of course, is to ensure that the judgment of Supreme Court modifying the award of the tribunal is implemented. And for this purpose, the major thing that this authority has to ensure is in relation to storage, usage, regulation and control of Kaveri waters. And in this sense, this authority becomes very, very powerful. Supreme Court in its award has distributed the Kaveri water usage but that is not distributed on the dam basis or every storage facility basis. So the regulation of the storage usage and discharge etc by every dam and storage facility that has to be done by this authority. Additionally, Kaveri Water Management Authority can also advise the state to take suitable measures to improve water usage efficiency. Authority's decision shall be final and binding with respect to storage, usage, regulation and control of Kaveri water for every storage facility. For example, in a dam, suppose the authority says that the water level has to be decreased so that the judgment of Supreme Court can be implemented. Now, in this case, the decision of the authority will be final. If the authority wants the level to be decreased, it has to be decreased. And if the state government are not listening to it, then the authority can take the help of the central government to implement its decision. And it has been decided that the total residual storage in any specified reservoir will be decided on June 1st every year. Also, in case of deficiency in water availability, the authority will consider reduction of water in different dams and storage facilities. And here also, the decision of the authority will be final and the decision will be taken by voting. And the state's proposal to create new storage facility will also be cleared by Kaveri Water Management Authority. So this is pretty powerful body. Kaveri Water Regulation Committee, as we have discussed, will work on ground. It will monitor the daily water levels in flows and storage positions at major reservoirs storing the Kaveri water. The problem with Kaveri Water Management Authority, however, is that it does not yet have full term chairman, despite the body being constituted now for two years. The authority is not fully functional and the southwest monsoon is about to set. So the notification to bring Kaveri Water Management Authority under the administrative control of the ministry, maybe formalization of this body will happen and it will become fully functional authority because that is crucial for successful implementation of Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal Award as modified by Supreme Court. There is an article on page number one, CBI arrests former NSCMD Chitra Ramakrishna. You must be following this news for quite some time and you must know that it's important for you to prepare corporate governance for the coming mains exam. Previously, many a times we have covered the area of corporate governance in the DNS already. You can find the reference in the description section. For now, I'm giving you a case study on corporate governance. You try and attempt this. Put your answer in the comment section and tomorrow morning I'll append a tentative answer in the case in the pinned comment. The case reads like this. India has one of the largest number of listed companies in the world and the efficiency and overall well-being of the financial market are critical for the society in general and the economy in particular. However, in the recent times, there has been an increasing concern in India to develop an effective corporate governance machinery, ethics and integrity in systems and anti-corruption agencies. In view of this, there is a need being felt to focus on three specific areas. 
which are directly relevant to the problems of internalizing integrity and ethics in the corporate sector. These three areas are anticipating specific threats to ethical standards and integrity in corporate governance, strengthening the ethical competence of the board members of the company, and developing administrative process and practices which promote ethical values and integrity in the corporate sector. Now the question is, suggest institutional measures to address the above three given issues. So please take some time in attempting this case. Put your answer in the comment section. If you put the answer in the comment section, I'll evaluate your answers as well. Now on your screen, you have question for the day. The question is, consider the following statements with reference to Nord Stream. Statement 1, it is an international pipeline situated in the Baltic region of Northern Europe. Statement 2, this pipeline is a joint venture of India, Germany and Russia. Correct statements would be what? 1 only, 2 only, both 1 and 2, neither 1 nor 2. The answer to yesterday's question would be option C. Statement 1, Vayu Shakti is a joint exercise of India and US Air Force is incorrect because it is not a joint exercise. It is an exercise to display the might of Indian Air Force. And statement 2 is correct as well because it is conducted in the border region between India and Pakistan in the Pokhran region of Pakistan.